First of all, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Ilya Kosmodemyansky, and uh, I'm working for PostgreSQLConsulting.com. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, I'm with Postgres now more than 10 years as DBA and consultant. And uh, previously, I was an Oracle DBA and partially DB2. Uh, and I will talk about disks with uh, PostgreSQL. Um, actually, uh, the main topic how PostgreSQL works with disk uh, is very complex and uh, it's uh, okay, it's not possible to cover it in a pretty large tutorial. Uh, I, I'm not saying about the talk. Uh, so it will be some, uh, some extraction of information which is uh, important for DBAs. That's why I call it checklist. So some topics will be not covered uh, indeed, but uh, I think uh, the checklist style will be uh, more useful for the people who practically works with PostgreSQL because all this information usually you need to collect from uh, different sources and sometimes uh, they say different things. Um, so the outline of uh, today's talk. Uh, why in general a database needs a disk? Uh, and what's special uh, uh, has Postgres about that? Uh, then uh, I will say about some bottlenecks with uh, disk performance and uh, the most important thing how to diagnose them because uh, okay you uh, could try to achieve the maximum performance uh, but in vacuum it's quite impossible you need to diagnose uh, where you have a problem and if you have a problem. Um, the important thing is that uh, tuning Postgres called disk performance. Uh, it's not only the magic with uh, Postgres curl conf because uh, you need a proper hardware, you need to configure it well, you need to uh, configure your operating system and everything uh, works only together. You could not uh, do something with uh, just one thing and try to uh, suppose that everything is okay. So that's the outline, Let, shall we start? Uh, first of all, why database needs a, a disk? That's quite obvious. It needs to read pages from the disk and it needs to write it. Uh, because uh, we have a pretty uh, world, world advanced uh, open source database, that means that it is transactional. Uh, so it writes write ahead log and then needs to synchronize the dirty pages from memory, which are recorded in uh, write ahead log already. Uh, it needs to sync it with data files. Uh, and uh, this process is uh, usually called checkpoint, and uh, it could be in any database an issue with our performance because uh, it's, it's implementation, it's ideology, it just need to put a lot of pages from memory to disk, and it could be a performance issue. Uh, then we talk about PostgreSQL. Uh, some addition, uh, there is some addition. Um, first of all, it's out of vacuum. Uh, you know that uh, PostgreSQL needs to uh, clean up old versions and uh, at least it could be uh, not uh, cost-free from terms of disk performance. Um, the second, uh, if it is not configured properly, uh, it causes a lot of another issues with your database, which finally will affect uh, disk performance. Uh, and uh, another specific thing is PGC log, the byte mask with uh, transaction states. Uh, I hope uh, you never experienced problems with disk contention on this one, uh, but it could be. Um, and uh, finally, some user queries related things such disk source hashing and temporary. Uh, in this talk, uh, because it's a checklist, I will concentrate on mostly on two topics. This one, the issue with checkpointing, and this one. And uh, mostly because uh, they are quite common, for example, among our clients, uh, then they came to us. Uh, it's a usual problem to, uh, the first question to ask, what is the outer vacuum and with checkpoints? Um, 
and uh, a couple of words about these two. If you have contention of PGC log, you could easily move that to the RAM disk uh, because it's uh, nothing bad could happen if uh, your RAM disk crashes. Uh, you will experience the short period uh, performance problems, uh, but then everything will be okay. Uh, so it's quite an easy task to move it to uh, RAM disk. Uh, but uh, this contention on this file, uh, that's about uh, very uh, heavy write workloads, transaction workloads, and I hope you never experience that. For these uh, things, uh, the main recipe is to uh, explain, explain, analyze, and uh, have a proper uh, work mem settings because your hashing could be uh, swapping on disk and it will be very, uh, very slow in that case. So the most problem with uh, many relational databases and Postgres by its design with uh, F-syncing, um, uh, this uh, synchronizing of data pages with uh, data files. Uh, usually uh, the page, the block from the disk travels uh, in this uh, stack or queue. Uh, then it is on disk, it's a page on disk, and then you read it uh, you just put it at shared buffers. And the important thing that it always travels through operating system cache because uh, it's the Postgres design, Postgres way. And then it becomes dirty. You uh, write the redo information to write a head log, uh, but the page still is dirty and still is in shared buffers. Uh, then you need to, to issue a checkpoint and uh, this uh, page will be synchronized using F-Sync to the disk. Uh, and uh, if somewhere in these uh, three things uh, you have not, not enough throughput, it could be an issue for the performance of the whole database. Uh, because if you have, for example, large hard buffers, uh, but bad disks or uh, unconfigured operating system cache, uh, you will stuck immediately. Uh, I believe, uh, and at last, PGCon in Ottawa, Greg Smith made uh, an excellent talk about uh, this throughput during uh, through these uh, things. And uh, if you want to know more details about that, I recommend to find the video. I believe uh, it it is it exists on YouTube. So, the, why we need checkpointing? Uh, why all this uh, pain with performance? Uh, like I have said, um, uh, the tuples, if one tuple became becomes dirty, uh, we need to mark the whole page as dirty and then we need to put it to um, disk, then we check point in. Uh, and uh, this periodical check pointing is designed to uh, make uh, the restore procedure then we try to restore from failure uh, or uh, something like that or just restart a database uh, to make it faster because we do not need to scan uh, wall right ahead log backwards. Uh, it could be very long. Uh, it could be a lot of right ahead uh, log segments, files. Uh, we just need to scan it backwards until checkpoint because at the checkpoint we know that it is synchronized. Uh, so we could not avoid these uh, spikes of writes, uh, but we could uh, make them uh, working a bit better. So how to understand that we have a problem with checkpoint? Uh, the first tool to use is uh, actually IOSTAT and its last column uh, percent of disk utilization. If from time to time periodically you have uh, spikes on up to 100 percent that means that something periodically eats your disk. Uh, and mo most likely it is uh, the checkpoint process if your configuration is untuned. Uh, then there is a PG start BG write, a single row view in PG catalog. I believe it, uh, it, is, it exists uh, in one and every uh, current, current supportable version of Postgres. Uh, and it looks like uh, uh, it comes a bit later. Uh, just a couple of words about uh, 
iostat and monitoring. Uh, it's quite common that people uh, just measure this metric, IOPS. Uh, and many uh, cloud hostings, they say that we guarantee an average and a maximum uh, throughput and they mean actually IOPS. Uh, then you use this metric uh, just alone. It's uh, particularly useless because uh, somewhere, especially in virtual appliances, uh, the latency uh, could play a significant role. If you have average throughput, for example, 10,000 IOPS, uh, and uh, the latency is not uniform, and sometimes it has spikes, sometimes uh, some of uh, operations are pretty slow in comparison with others. Uh, for, for the database, it could be an issue. It's bad for your optimizer, it's bad for uh, writing uh, to disk. So the, uh, at least you need uh, IOPS plus latency and uh, percent of utilization because uh, using this metric you could understand uh, uh, how many writes and reads uh, your uh, disk subsystem uh, could, ma uh, could manage uh, because you only have the 100% of, of your disk. Uh, in addition, it's not bad to have all these metrics. So uh, you have higher start and try to use all metrics uh, it shows here. Uh, the good thing is to have uh, everything about that on uh, the graph uh, because graph allows you to see the trend. You could just sample something uh, from Iostat and uh, see no problem because uh, the spikes are rare and from time to time, uh, for example, in hot business hours, uh, your database uh, eats 100% of I.O. and you could not see it just using the files. So uh, put everything on the graphs. That's just, for example, the adding of uh, LSI made uh, SSD accelerator shows that uh, disk utilization decreases drastically. Uh, that's why you need uh, to monitor uh, everything on graph. Uh, without it, it's difficult to uh, to say, for example, if your settings change helped and if you have a problem. So PG start BG writer. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, uh, pretty uh, bad. That means the uh, Postgre systems uh, not tuned well just from uh, where I'm there on my laptop. Um, the important thing is uh, that uh, you can uh, reset it periodically. And if we say about uh, tuning disk performance using PG start BG writer, I would say you need to uh, uh, reset it once upon a day. Uh, because for a long time it's practically useless uh, because it's uh, a lot of information uh, which you could not interpret. Sometimes when you need to um, localize a particular issue, you could reset it once per an hour and see if were the results of your uh, settings change. Um, you see, um, the first column is uh, how much checkpoints uh, occurred uh, by timeout, and the second one is how much checkpoints uh, requested because a lot of segments uh, write it. And uh, the most thing, how, how I could recognize if I do not know that, uh, that that is a bad and tuned uh, instance of Postgres that uh, I have both of them. If I have a heavy writes, I, I would like to try to benefit from writing at once uh, to my fast disks, uh, so my good rate controller, a lot of checkpoints. And uh, it will be checkpoints by request uh, 29 plus 13, and here will be zero. Uh, at this moment, it's, uh, uh, it's enough uh, to know about PGStat BG Writer, but uh, we'll return uh, to that several times. This one is a better one uh, from the server with uh, hard write workload, and this server, if I don't mistake, can produce it about, uh, in peak times, about uh, 8,000 uh, requested checkpoints per hour. It's pretty high uh, workload. Uh, and you see uh, uh, this for this is sample for ten hours. Uh, 
Uh, uh, so uh, here, uh, no checkpoints by timeout, only checkpoints by request. Uh, and we, we shall see, uh, does, does anybody uh, uh, any time uh, looks into the documentation with uh, meaning of all these fields? One, two, three. Yeah, well, <laughs> I shall say a bit about that. Uh, the next important uh, things are uh, how much spent uh, the checkpointer process uh, in right phase. Uh, the second is uh, in the sync phase because you need write and then you need to sync. Uh, and uh, this uh, thing, buffers clean, is how much uh, dirty pages uh, was dumped not using checkpointer but using uh, background writer. In Postgres, uh, you could uh, dump the dirty pages uh, from the shared memory using, uh, in general, two good ways. It's the dedicated checkpointer process and a background writer who works in background uh, that, fo uh, that follows that uh, from its name. Uh, and uh, it could uh, steadily uh, dump the dirty pages between checkpoints and uh, you could use it to avoid uh, very high spikes of I.O. during the checkpoint. Uh, that's the most important columns and we'll return to them a bit later in this talk. So uh, that's what I have said. Uh, it's a nice idea to put everything on graphic. You can see uh, here the green one is uh, buffers uh, dumped by checkpoint, uh, the red one uh, buffers dumped by flushed by a uh, background writer and you see the correlation with uh, disk output. For example, you have, that's uh, not a good example. That's, uh, here they have the problems with IO. You see this 75% and uh, our disk are almost <coughs> utilized completely. That's not a good idea because if you have uh, some spike on your internet site or in your system, uh, you have too small room here to uh, cope with, uh, with uh, this spike. Uh, and here, uh, the uh, background writer um, uh, just uh, dumped some pages because probably we changed something here in configuration parameters. And you see the disk utilization sl uh, slightly goes down. Uh, so uh, the graph is the good uh, thing to uh, to see how to work with that uh, things because uh, here you cl clearly could see that uh, IO utilization spikes caused by intensive work of checkpoints. Uh, finally, the checklist, what we need to do. The first thing is to get the proper hardware because if you have um, one set of disk in your server, uh, it doesn't matter how good your server is. Uh, you could have a lot of uh, uh, memory, you have a lot of CPU, but uh, if you have uh, one single uh, bad disk, uh, at this picture uh, you will see the problem uh, right here. And it doesn't matter how everything else works, you just have a problem with that. Uh, so the idea is, uh, first of all, to buy the proper RAID controller. Uh, the proper one is uh, that that uh, has its own processor because uh, if it uses your CPU uh, for its rate things, uh, it's even worse than uh, the software rate because it will be very, very slow. The second thing, uh, most modern rate controllers uh, have uh, an option of a battery cache and you need to buy uh, this option because with the battery uh, you could use the cache of uh, RAID controller to improve your RAID performance and this cache is backed by the battery and if you have an outage uh, your data will be not lost. Uh, as a manufacturer I do not like to advertise some uh, manufacturer of uh, hardware but uh, usually then we work with LSI or its Dell analog. Uh, it's quite okay, uh, the utilities are very conservative and usually you know what you are doing. With uh, Hewlett Packard, for example, we ex uh, experienced it, uh, a couple of times the problem that they have top range uh, rate controller and its interface shaped to work only with top range disk from Hewlett Packard. And if you install another disk, 
uh, you get the uh, SATA uh, speed of exchange information between disk and RAID controller. Uh, so you, if you use uh, HP, uh, it could be very good hardware, but you uh, definitely need to check by part numbers if it works together, uh, because such problems exist. Uh, the important thing, you need to monitor uh, your battery state because uh, if uh, your battery fails, uh, first of all, you will experience uh, the automatic switch of your controller to work with uh, the absence of a battery and uh, that will cause uh, a problem with your you know, performance immediately. Uh, the second uh, settings of uh, RAID controller is to uh, use cache mode uh, right back. Uh, that's uh, an obvious thing. Uh, you just need to uh, benefit from uh, your RAID controller cache, not from your disk cache. Uh, because right through, uh, that means uh, your operating system uh, returns uh, from the F-Sync and finally uh, it thinks that everything is okay, then uh, it puts uh, the data from the RAID controller cache uh, to the disk cache. And this disk cache uh, mostly, mo mo most likely uh, could lose the data in case of outage. Of course, you could have a proper enterprise level SSDs uh, which have a, a capacitor on it and it could uh, dump your data uh, if uh, the electricity uh, black out. But um, you should be sure that uh, it exists. Uh, not with any disk it works. IO mode uh, should be direct as in most cases uh, because uh, the now option uh, IO mode cached means that your uh, cache uh, will be used for both writes and reads and uh, with the PostgreSQL with any database actually you do not need this uh, read caching on your read controller because uh, it will be double caching. Uh, or triple caching in case of PostgreSQL because um, uh, you, uh, you benefit from uh, the clean or dirty pages uh, from the shared buffers to read them. Uh, and if it will be on um, RAID controller cache, uh, you will now never benefit from it because it's too slow for the database. And uh, disk write cache mod uh, will be disabled with, this is obvious too, like cache mod. Uh, the next step is uh, to afford a proper uh, disks into your proper RAID controller because everything uh, coupled very tight. Uh, first of all, if you use serial attached SCSI, uh, you prefer to use the small fill fac uh, form factor uh, because uh, you will benefit from the physics or from geometry. Uh, according to the tests, uh, the sick time for small uh, serial attached SCSI is faster two or three times and uh, for, for the database is uh, important. Um, many people believe that SSD will save this word and makes uh, the DBA job uh, quite useless. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's not so easy because, for example, if you uh, put the desktop level uh, chip disks uh, to your server, uh, you could uh, have a very poor performance and your system will be pretty unreliable because it uh, could not uh, read write uh, a lot of data uh, and the disk fails uh, shortly uh, in comparison with enterprise level SSDs. So if you use uh, SSDs, especially pure SSD database installation for your OTP database, uh, try to use uh, top level enterprise intels uh, because they provide uh, sufficient um, reliability and uh, they could work fast and predictable. Uh, the another thing that with pure SSD installation um, uh, you could uh, not benefit uh, drastically about write and write ahead log, for example, because it's sequential operation and probably uh, the better idea to uh, keep some hybrid installation to have some uh, really hot data uh, in the special table space uh, with um, SSDs and everyone else on fast uh, serial attached SCSI uh, that will be more reliable and 
um, actually to be safer. Today uh, exists some uh, top-level SSDs with uh, life cycle uh, comparable with uh, serial attached SCSI. Uh, but I never recommend it right now because I could only uh, check that in two years because uh, disk uh, lives some time. <laughs> And uh, at the moment, uh, such disks are relatively new, and I never seen the SSD disk uh, on pure SSD installation, which leaves uh, such long as uh, serial attached SCSI. So maybe in two years, uh, this this all becomes uh, a bit obsolete. Uh, uh, this is, I think, clear for database. Traditionally, we use uh, RAID 10, 1 plus 0, because uh, it's a good compromise between reliability and speed. Uh, sometimes people try to benefit from RAID 5, RAID 6. Uh, actually, uh, the size of disk uh, uh, and the price of that size uh, today doesn't matter so much. Uh, but uh, RAID 10 uh, wins clearly about the speed and reliability of the RAID 5 and RAID 6. Uh, and uh, the final problem, if you could not use the proper hardware, uh, the only thing to make uh, your database fast is to turn off synchronous commit. But you must understand that, uh, for example, if you have financial data and you turn it off, uh, your application could think that uh, you received from commit and the transaction is, was saved successfully, but it could be lost uh, laterly. And it's quite impossible to uh, find such uh, cases because uh, for a uh, brief examination, your data is consistent, but you have lost uh, all transactions. Uh, and uh, it's not a good idea if uh, your data is valuable. And I think uh, most of people who use their databases think that uh, their the data is valuable. Uh, and uh, it could be user's data, it could be financial data, it could be uh, DBA salary data, something like that. Uh, the, next, uh, the next tier is file system. And generally, if we're talking about performance, uh, we advise XFS or X4 now. Uh, which, which one that's mostly religious dispute, but uh, some of them. Because of, uh, for example, ZFS, ZFS uh, or some LVM uh, provides comfort for operations. You could change slices, you could uh, resize them, and so on. But um, these things uh, have their own cost. And uh, if you uh, switch off all these comfort things, uh, for example, in ZFS, uh, you could uh, achieve the same, probably, uh, performance uh, things like an XFS or the X4, but uh, without this comfort. Um, so, mm, in generally, XFS or X4. Uh, the important thing, uh, this thing uh, is wide known. Uh, no time makes uh, file system faster. But the second thing is uh, quite commonly uh, misunderstood. If you have uh, the RAID controller with battery backed cache, uh, you need to turn the barrier off. The barrier is the syscall, which, uh, which is called then uh, your um, Linux, uh, for example, could not write uh, the journal data for the data which is already uh, at the disk or vice versa. That means it issue a barrier and uh, then it stops to flush pages uh, to disk and tries to resort kernel buffer to, uh, uh, to find uh, the journal data for the data which is on disk already or uh, the data for the journal data which is on disk. And uh, if you have a lot of shared buffers, uh, today it's quite common to have 128, for example, uh, the things will be uh, very, very slow. So if you would like to benefit from your RAID controller, you must turn it off. And if, yeah. Um, then you use uh, disk array. 
the things are really differ from uh, the manufacturer of the disks. Uh, that array, but in general, there uh, a lot of things are common. You just uh, need to uh, to see uh, the recommendations for the rate controller and see uh, how you could implement that in your uh, disk array. Uh, usually, uh, one and every vendor uh, issues some uh, recommendations of uh, how you should tune that. For example, from uh, Intel, uh, from a Sun arrays. IBM arrays, uh, I never seen uh, the bad advices in, in such manuals. So you just need to see, and uh, the ideas are quite the same like with hardware array controller. Uh, we go on up, and now we reach uh, operating system level. And in operating system, uh, we have something like uh, the same thing. I mean, it's a database, <laughs> something like database. And uh, you have uh, such parameters as uh, duty ratio. The first of uh, them is uh, uh, which percent of uh, kernel buffer uh, is allowed to use for duty pages before the PD flash uh, or another flash daemon uh, will uh, flash the pages uh, to the disk. Uh, and in most Linux distributions, this ratio is 10% for uh, I think default and uh, maximum ratio, and that means that between 10% fill and 20% fill, uh, something uh, will, uh, the data pages will be dumped. Uh, imagine that you have uh, 128 uh, gigabits of operating system uh, memory, and you have 25% for shadowed buffers. And uh, you only will start when uh, you have uh, definitely more dirty pages than uh, your rate controller cache could afford. Uh, and that is a bad thing because uh, almost mm, there are very, very, uh, uh, probably with uh, enterprise array, you could afford something like that, but uh, with normal disk, uh, RAID disk controller, it's quite impossible. So my advice is to switch to alternative method, uh, data background bytes and calculate it based on how much BBU you have on your uh, RAID controller. Uh, if you set these parameters, uh, this and this will be effectively zero, and you will, this an alternative one, and you always could check if you have uh, the proper settings for your disk array. Of course, if you do not use uh, BBU-backed uh, uh, rate, uh, you should uh, keep these values much, much smaller, at least divided by uh, four for uh, this example. And finally, uh, if you have everything in place, you could uh, try to benefit from better checkpointing in Postgres. Uh, they usually recommend uh, to set checkpoint timeout to infinity. Uh, the maximum value today is one hour, and uh, that means that most likely you will uh, checkpoint by the checkpoint segment. Uh, you could set it, for example, to some large amount and uh, then your database will only checkpoint uh, that it has a lot of uh, data. Uh, that causes uh, a little bit slower recovery, but you can choose all this. Uh, the, my, uh, my advice is to choose between checkpoint by timeout or checkpoint by segments. Do not mix it together. Uh, when you checkpoint by segments, this is, will, it will be very high. If you checkpoint by timeout, if you need a uh, special point on recovery uh, to, to, to be fast, uh, you just keep this very large and you, you always checkpoint by timeout. Uh, then you checkpoint, uh, your idea is uh, to avoid the spikes of disk uh, IO utilization. That means uh, you will try to set checkpoint completion target to 0.7 or 0.9 to spread the IO activity between two checkpoints. Postgres could manage that uh, pretty well and uh, instead of having uh, one and every sync just 
10%, uh, for example, if you set here uh, 0 0.1 uh, right after the checkpoint happens, uh, you try to prolong this uh, between checkpoints and uh, your mm, disk utilization will be slightly lower. So uh, with heavy workloads, uh, such settings uh, in most cases works well. You could check if uh, your operating system hardware and, and everything else uh, was configured properly. In, uh, I believe in most uh, nine versions of Postgres, there is a utility called pgtestfsync. It has pretty huge output. There's only uh, one piece of that. Uh, and it, it really issues the checkpoint, uh, the fsync operations the same uh, like with checkpoint. And if you, for example, have something like that, uh, it's maybe okay, it's manageable to leave it that. Uh, if you have uh, two times more, most likely uh, you can uh, work with uh, very high uh, right workloads. And for example, if it is two times less than these values, that definitely means uh, you have a problems. Uh, most likely you have a uh, barrier enabled or something like that. Uh, so uh, if you remount something, if you upgrade your hardware, just uh, check this one. Uh, it, it helps to avoid the stupid mistakes. Uh, and some, finally, some small trick about uh, checkpointing and then the, uh, I will say a bit about how to work home. Uh, as I said, uh, the another way to uh, dump dirty pages in Postgres is uh, to use background writer. Uh, and uh, it has its parameters in Postgres code conf. And if you have intensive uh, writes, uh, you could try to uh, keep these values uh, close to max values. That means then uh, BG writer delay happens. Uh, it will be awakened and uh, for one scan, it will dump uh, this value of uh, dirty pages. Uh, that means uh, that uh, between checkpoints, uh, your background writer uh, could really help because usually uh, it is not so heavy loaded like checkpointer uh, and, uh, and background, it could dump a lot of pages and uh, the performance will be better because it allows to spread uh, the disk utilization between uh, checkpoints uh, more or less. And uh, one more comment. Uh, these defaults actually are for not uh, heavy write workloads because uh, if uh, you, you have not very high workload, uh, you need to uh, avoid uh, to aggressive uh, work of uh, background writer. Uh, so uh, why uh, it's important to not forget how to work home? Uh, I think uh, uh, who uh, tries to switch uh, uh, once how uh, to work home off? Ah. <laughs> and what's the, the result was obvious. Finally, your database uh, has a problems. A lot of problems, but uh, in terms of disk performance, uh, the most problem is that uh, your database will be larger, the fragmentation will be higher, and finally you will have a lot of uh, dirty pages uh, which, could be, uh, which, which could contain uh, not a lot of tuples. And that means uh, your checkpoint uh, will have uh, much more pages uh, to dump to disk. It's not a nice idea to have uh, at all. And uh, then uh, your auto vacuum is not aggressive enough that, uh, that then it could not cope with uh, disk load. It will uh, work longer and uh, more intensively probably. And uh, that is not cheap from the point of view of disk I.O. So usually then you have auto vacuum. I think many uh, speakers uh, told about that. Uh, you could um, keep it as aggressive as possible. Uh, here, mm, my normal advice is to use scale factor, and that means then 1% of data in your table changed, uh, it will be auto vacuumed. And normally it's uh, quite enough for proper settings uh, of auto vacuum in, in modern versions of Postgres. Uh, but small addition to that uh, is that sometimes uh, you need 
uh, some improvements to that things. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, sometimes you need to uh, avoid uh, high disk usage of Apto Acom. And then uh, the poor man uh, idea, but uh, very useful in practice, is to renize and ionize them uh, using cron uh, periodically. And it really works. It's, it's a better, better, better solution from my point of view than uh, nap time and so on. Uh, because uh, it, it really does not hurt <laughs> after vacuum and it works. Uh, but uh, resource consumption in your uh, database server uh, is much better. Uh, the second trick is then you have uh, bad disks or you have heavy write workload. You just can uh, maximize uh, a, a bit, uh, increase your max workers for up to Acom. Why it is uh, actually important? Uh, because by default you have three of them. And for example, uh, here uh, we have out of vacuum, the red line is max value of uh, uh, max workers. Uh, and then we have three of them. Uh, sometimes we see that uh, all the time all the workers are busy. And that means if all the three workers are busy and you are trying to, uh, for example, next table uh, needs to be out of vacuum, uh, it will be in queue. Then next worker will be free, it could auto work on that table. But uh, it will be not 1% of changes. It could be 10% of changes, 20% of changes. And that makes your auto work on not aggressive enough. So if you see on your graphic, for example, that uh, almost 80% of time all your auto work on workers are busy, uh, you need to increase that value and then you will see that uh, things are really better because uh, you will not have such uh, shelves here, like here. Uh, so that's important from the point of view of disk performance for auto vacuum. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank our client who provide us with all these uh, tricky cases uh, to cope with my colleagues. Uh, who, who actually in charge about that, and the team of Okmeta IO who provides such beautiful graphics. So if you have any questions, you could ask them now or just email me later and I will answer. Thank you. Do you have any setup on OpenStack with the, the, the components? I'm sorry? On OpenStack. So have you virtualized your platform using OpenStack? From time to time, but uh, generally we do not. I would say that uh, for small workloads, it's, it doesn't matter. But for high physical, it's better. Yes. If you have good disk, uh, you should decrease that because it it allows out. Increase that uh, because it allows uh, after Wacom to to work more aggressively. Yeah. Yes, that, that's a good point. Uh, yes, ten, twenty, something like that. Uh, more, it's uh, I think it doesn't matter. Uh, after Wacom. Um, cost limit. After Wacom, Wacom cost, cost limit, this one. So what is negative one? Hmm? What is negative one? Disabled. So negative one means you don't have to use the regular task limit for, for any Yes, that, that means uh, the special one is disabled. Yeah. Are these slides available? Uh, it will be available. I will publish that and I think organizers too. Just that activity. 
or just uh, pairs, if you prefer that. You need actually information uh, what this auto vacuum work is doing, analyze or something like that. Uh, then you need that activity that's most, most convenient for it. More questions? Yes. Uh, I would say that if you have heavy write workload and if you have a high I/O utilization by check pointer, uh, it's a good idea if you have good disks actually to uh, to let uh, background writer work, and that is uh, you, you you could usually could see that uh, the disk I/O utilization decreases. The only case then you do not need uh, this PG stat, PG writer, or this uh, background writer uh, uh, to be aggressive is then you have low uh, write workload and uh, it, it hurts a bit uh, uh, cache and uh, it hurts a bit reads. Uh, so by default, if you do not need this aggressive behavior, you do not need to turn it on. But uh, if, you, if you need, you need it. I, I never saw that uh, that caused the problems. Some more questions. So if no questions, I would like to thank you. And if you have some more, you can just easily write me or <coughs> ask here today. Thank you.